The Tom Woods Show, episode 998. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, unless you want to live in fear forever of your social justice warrior boss, you better have some kind of side hustle going on in case it should ever come to that. I've built up online income streams that allow me to work from anywhere I want and say whatever I want. Check out my free ebook on how I do it at pathstoincome.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Today we're talking about a very, very important name in the libertarian world, a name you need to know, and that's Hans Hermann Hoppe, who is probably, if not the most significant libertarian thinker in the world today. He's certainly in the top five, no question about that, extremely important and influential and certainly played a role in helping me understand libertarianism better. There's, uh, he's got just a razor-sharp mind. If you've got a bad argument, it is going to be shredded and in tatters by the time Hans is done with it. He's a brilliant guy. Murray Rothbard could not say enough good things about him. And joining me to talk about Hans Hoppe, who is controversial. There are a lot of people who strongly dislike him and yet have never read a single one of his books. Gee, I wonder what that would be like. I can't imagine going through that experience, somebody smearing you without reading your books. Well, anyway, Hans has had that experience quite a bit. So we're actually going to talk about his books. There's a novel approach. And joining me to do that is Stefan Kinsella, longtime student of Hans Hoppe. Stefan is founder and executive director of Libertarian Papers, founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, and the author of numerous articles and books on international property law, international law, and the application of libertarian principles to legal topics. You can find out more about Stefan and his work at stefankinsella.com. Stefan, welcome back to the show. Thanks much, Tom. All right, so here you are on your way to Turkey today as we're talking, and yet at the last minute you were able to fit in an episode with me, and I sure appreciate it. Maybe we'll talk later about why you're headed to Turkey, because it's not a million miles removed from the topic of our discussion today. But I would say it's hard at least for me to think of somebody, maybe other than Karl Marx, where both his supporters and his critics have not read him than the case of Hans Hermann Hoppe. I mean, his supporters love him for what they think he's all about, and his detractors hate him for what they think he's all about. But you ask, well, What is his position on empiricism and positivism? They don't even know what the question means. So I'm not so sure these people are reading him. So I thought, I know Kinsella has read Hoppe even more thoroughly than I have. So let's let's talk about him. How did you first get to hear about this guy? I mean, with me, it was just uh, I wanted to read every single thing the Mises Institute had. And back in those days, in the old days, that used to be possible. (laughs) It, it was, uh, and you probably were like me, and when I was in college and law school, I read like every issue of Liberty Magazine, the free market newsletter from Mises, uh, Reason Magazine. So, you know, I was reading in, uh, the Ayn Rand newsletter. You know, there was there was only so much, and yeah, I read it all. Um, but I think Hans came to my attention. He started appearing early in the pages of the um, – I think the Austrian economics newsletter put out by Mises in the early 80s, and also Liberty Magazine had a big symposium in 1988 on his argumentation ethics. And I was in law school, and it blew me away, absolutely blew me away. We did an episode on argumentation ethics, so I'll link to that. And then I also did an episode where I just – I walked through one chapter from Hoppe's book, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property, which is an amazing book. I just walked through the chapter on um, banking and society and where he starts from barter. Yeah, ba- and he, banking, nation states, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember the – and. A, a sociological reconstruction of the present economic order, I think, is the is the subtitle. <laughs> it's it's but, one of his best articles. It's, it's so packed with insights. It, it's so explosive, and wow, you understand the world better, so much better after you read it. So I made that, and, and I think my title for that episode was a little clickbaity because I said Hans Hoppe on blah, blah, blah. So people must think, oh, Hans is on the show. No, it's just me talking about his ideas. So who knows if that'll ever happen. I know he's not big into audio interviews these days. But anyway. Uh, I will see him tomorrow, and I'm going to put a bug in his ear and try yeah, to. Yeah, you got to. You, you got to. I mean, he's already done me a favor. 
I, I can't give away precisely what, but it'll become clear at my 1,000th episode event on September 30th. But anyway, um, let's let's talk about some of his significant work. And there's a there's I mean I the first two things I got at the same time I got a theory of socialism and capitalism, one of his books, yes. and then the economics and ethics of private property. So well, the argumentation ethics thing, which is his his defense of libertarianism, uh, it's a defense that's I, I had never heard before. I, I certainly I haven't heard the let's just say I hadn't heard the uh, the libertarian spin that he put on it before. Correct. I think I think this is his his creation, but we have devoted an episode to that. Let's talk about other things that that he does. First of all, what's your favorite book length work of his then? Well, for me, it's clearly uh, the theory of social a theory of socialism and capitalism. Um, maybe just because I read it first, uh, or maybe because it's it's actually a systematic work. It's not a collection of essays, which most of his other works are. Um, and that book, it it does lay out an extensive defense of his argumentation ethics uh, in the middle of the book in chapter seven, if I recall. But the first two chapters, chapters one and two, do a really good job of laying out the kind of foundational ideas for property theory, which he uses in his uh, economic reasoning and his libertarian reasoning elsewhere. So just chapters one and two, which are very short, are just packed full of really concise definitions like the way he uh, defines aggression, contract, property, socialism, capitalism uh, is extremely helpful and uh, uh, much more clear than the way a lot of other writers use it, which is more of a loosey-goosey kind of way. Um so the one I reviewed was uh, – so I, I encountered that book in 88 or so, 89 when it came out when I was in law school, when I had read about the other stuff. And then he released The Economics and Ethics of Private Property, which you just mentioned, which is this, the one after that, um, which is also fantastic. It's a collection of essays um, which are related in, in two different parts, philosophy and, um, and uh, economics. Um, and I did a, a, a lengthy book review essay of that book for a law review, and I sent it to Hans in 94, and I didn't know him at the time, and he sent me a warm letter back. And so I met him for the first time along with Lou Rockwell and uh, David Gordon and uh, and Rothbard actually in 1994 in November at the John Randolph Club meeting in D.C. Yeah, then you and I were, were must have been there at this – because I was there too. Yeah, that's the yeah, first thing I had ever done with any of these – them and um, and the Rothbard, of course, died in January like uh, two, three months later. So I was lucky to meet him um, there. But uh, yeah, so Hans and I became – and so then Hans became the editor of the JLS and a co-editor of the QJAE, the Journal of Libertarian Studies and the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics after Rothbard's death. And because I had just come into their sort of you know presence, um, he asked me to be the book review editor for the JLS. So that's how that started. So I've had a long friendship with him and um, followed his work you know throughout the years. There's an article that Rothbard wrote about Hans where he's going after some of Hans's opponents, and he's saying, you know, maybe the problem people have with Hans, although they'd never say it, is that he's so relentlessly logical, and he is so careful and devastating in his demolition of bad ideas that it's hard to take. And 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 Rothbard sums it up by saying, uh, well, shape up, guys. In argument as in politics, those who can't stand deductivist heat should get out of the philosophic or economic kitchen. <laughs> so he loved, he absolutely loved Hans uh, Rothbard. Did. So Hoppe has great treatment of the subject of public goods, for example, which is used to justify the state. There are certain goods that the market just won't produce in quantities that neoclassical economists consider to be optimal for various reasons. So therefore, we have to have the state. And Hans will have none of that, but but more than just public goods, his point is uh, an extension of Rothbard's that he comes to reject the state altogether because he says the the same arguments you make about why we need certain state programs are the arguments that socialists make for why we need further state programs. So if if one group of arguments is bad, the other group of arguments must likewise be bad. There's, there's no analytical reason that these particular goods are any different from those. So in other words, that's where the public goods argument w- ultimately winds you up, uh, our side of the public goods thing, that the, these things are th- – this is, this is an analytical mess, this whole public goods thing. You, you can't analytically distinguish these different sorts of goods. So therefore, there's no class of goods that must be supplied by the state, so we don't need the state. Over and above the moral problems with the state, we just don't need it. Yeah. And, and that, that's pretty tough medicine for a lot of people. 
Yeah, and that's a chapter, if I recall, in his 94 uh, Economics and Ethics of Private Property. He demolishes the public goods uh, uh, approach, uh, and he has another good one on, on antitrust theory. But if you notice what he does there, um, he relies really heavily on praxeology, on Mises' method of economics, right? So he always does this. It, as I think I noted in one of my uh, afterwards or forwards, more than anyone else I know, Hoppe really – like he doesn't just give lip service to praxeology like some – so-called Austrian thinkers do. like They never use it in their reasoning. Hans uses it consistently all the time. He really relies upon it and, and, and extends it. So I think just for example, he noticed that the Austrian notion that all goods are subjective, right? There's a subjective quality to them, means that no good is ever perfectly public or private. And I think he's got a similar point about other types of goods. It depends upon how the user perceives these goods, right? Just like something is not purely a capital good or a consumer good, it depends upon how a human actor perceives it subjectively. So there's no binary external objective classification of these goods, which is partly his point, right? You can't objectively say something is objectively a public good and then build some political theory on it. Now, getting back to that uh, earlier book, A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, with a book title like that, with no subtitle, which is very rare in academic publishing, right? Usually a three-paragraph subtitle. It's just A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. What is the Hoppian theory of socialism and capitalism? Yes, um, and I think there actually might be a subtitle, Tom. I think it's Economics, Politics, and Ethics. Oh, you're right. Darn it. Okay. <laughs> but well, it's, hardly ever, it's hardly ever used. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, fair. But I, I think does economics and ethics of private property have a, a subtitle? I thought uh, he had at least one with no it subtitle. May. It yeah. may. All right, it doesn't matter. <laughs> his his merits stand on their own, uh, regardless of this question. Well, his his uh, his monograph on um, the nature of Austrian methodology. I'm getting the title wrong. I think has no subtitle. But <laughs> and uh, the, say the great fiction, which is his third series of essays. Now, and by the way, I'll, I'll get into uh, TSC. But he did have a couple of other works published in German earlier, which have right. still never been translated into English, which is a frustration for me because I can't read German. So I'm hoping someday some Hoppian. German English Hoppian speaker will translate some of those earlier works. Um, hint, hint, all you listeners out there. Hint, hint. All right, so go ahead. But so his theory of socialism, capital. First, he gets to like what I call essentialist definitions, and I've heard some people criticize Hans for his definition of socialism because what he says is the essence of socialism is is really just the institutionalized aggression with private property rights it's not simply the centralized control but again because again you know there's no hard and fast definition or objective di difference between capital and other goods this is an economic classification um, so his point is yes we can define socialism as a centralized uh, control of the means of production, but the essence of it is any institutionalized interference with private property claims. And then he defines private property claims as those that arise from the kind of the classical libertarian uh, bases like uh, original appropriation or homesteading a la Locke and then con contractual transfer basically. So his theory is that anytime you have a state, you have a degree of socialism, and anytime you have socialism, you have injustice and inefficiency. Um, what is really illuminating is after his first two chapters in the a theory of socialism and capitalism where he sets out the basic categories and, and concepts he's going to use, chapters I think three, four, five, and maybe six, they they analyze different types of socialism. So he'll he'll uh, he criticizes socialism Russian style, which we would call communism. He's, he criticizes the socialism of conservatism. Okay, so he's anti-conservative or, or you know, fascism. You could say he criticizes the socialism of social engineering. Okay, and things like that. So he he breaks different types of socialism down into uh, different classifications, but and finds common things to criticize about all of them. And that's what's so interesting about this. And of course, he also has a chapter in. Uh, Democracy, the God that Failed, where he he talks about libertarianism and conservatism, and uh, he does not have much patience with conservatives who make the argument that well we do after all need a welfare state. He says no, the welfare state undermines all the things you conservatives claim to support. So he, he is so rigorous in his opposition to all these different approaches that it's it's really exciting and interesting to read. And and I'd like to just share and. 
episode that I bet most people listening don't know. People in my private group know it because I shared it there, but almost nobody knows it. Were you at the John Randolph Club meeting in 1995? No, no. I just went to the first one. Okay. So, but do you know what happened in that year? Not sure. Okay, well, this is the year the, the John Randolph Club was a, a meeting of libertarians like Lou Rockwell and Murray Rothbard and David Gordon and you know other people have been on the show. And then on the other hand, it was the paleocons. These yeah. were anti-interventionists. Well, now that the Cold War is over, they want to shut down NATO. They want to bring the troops home. So, you know, why wouldn't you want to? talk to them. And these days, this whole thing is being, uh, people say, oh, they were allying with with Nazis or white national. Well, that's because today everybody's considered a Nazi. If you look at these people, Tom Fleming may be an irascible character, but he was no Nazi. Right? He's just a regular, you know, he was just a, he's a non-neocon conservative. Or Bill Kaufman. What mm-hmm. a wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. I, what a thrill to get to meet Bill Kaufman. There's nothing wrong with, with him. Why would you not want to talk to conservatives who want to abolish, you know, or to slash the warfare state? Well, anyway, Anyway, after Rothbard died, uh, Rothbard and Tom Fleming, I think, were the two personalities, one from each camp, that were really holding that thing together. And I don't think it could really hold without that glue. So when after Rothbard died, some of the divisions between the two groups began to, to get greater and greater because the libertarians kind of felt like we're willing to learn from the conservatives about a lot of cultural issues, but they got to learn some economics. And it seems like a lot of them aren't, and they're still talking about protectionism and this and that. So Hans got up at the 1995 conference and didn't name any names, but he basically said that some of what he's hearing about you know, nationalistic economic policy, he says, runs the risk of bleeding over into – National socialism. I mean, not, yes. not that these people are outright Nazis, but that you're more or less advocating an economic approach that approximates that, and I don't want to have any part of that. And so that wound up splitting the whole group, that the yes. conservatives were so upset that Hans had criticized them like that, that that pr- pretty much blew the whole thing apart. Now, nobody knows that, and of course, no one would believe that, because of course, these days, well, Hop is a Nazi, by people who have never read him, they've heard three out-of-context sentences, they would have no idea that it was Hans, before they were even born, who was saying, there are trends here that... I don't want to be part of, and I have to reject wholeheartedly. That was Hans Hoppe who did that. And I thought, on this episode, it might be relevant to throw that in. Yes, and uh, in uh, the meeting I'm going to today is the annual meeting of the Property and Freedom Society, which Hans founded in 2006. So this is our 12th or something meeting. Um, And on the fifth annual meeting, which is about 2010 or so, Hans gave a speech, which is on VDARE and also on – it's on Vimeo. I can give you the link. It's, it was called Reflections on the PFS After Five Years, and he talked in detail about uh, that split with the paleo conservatives. And he and he's also got another paper on uh, like the Middle American Illusions of Sam Francis or something like that, a draft paper, which is good, which is online too. And he explicitly says basically, listen, it was going to be an alliance, and we were going to learn some cultural things from them, which we did, but they refused to learn their economic lessons from us. So he is explicitly critical of these guys. Um, yeah. And his talk, by the way, uh, on Sunday, I believe, is going to be on the alt-right. So I'm interested to see what he has to say about them. Yeah, I will be too. And I mean, his criticisms from 1995 are you know, the same sorts of things uh, I, would, well, I would say much more. I would be much tougher with these people. And let, let me let me let me also mention that um, uh, it's just part of this whole history. You know, in Hans turned sixty years old in in um, two thousand and nine, and so Guido Holzman, who Guido and I became friends going to our first Mises conference together, and we were both going there to study under Hans, basically me for legal and political theory and Guido for economics, and we've become we stayed good friends over the years. And we decided to do a festrift for Hans, which is like you know a collection of uh, of articles in memory of a of a notable thinker, and we published it right before his birthday. In I think you were at the ceremony, Tom. If not, I was. I've got a great picture where I'm standing like right behind Hans while he's grinning from ear to ear because you guys had successfully managed to keep this project a secret from him. We did. Uh, he thought it was a birthday thing or something. But if you look at the volume, uh, the the array of scholars in there is just incredible it's all over the world um guido and i we split the project up and we sort of humorously said well kinsella 
you take America and Guido, the German, will take the rest of the world <laughs> because <laughs> it was about half and half that way, you know, because most of the scholars are concentrated here. So it was funny that we split it up, <laughs> the globe up between us that way. But uh, it's a beautiful book and beautiful uh, sentiments from there. There's, there's Bob Higgs and, 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 and Lou and scholars from Pascal Salon and uh, scholars from all over the world. And uh, it, it just shows the depth of his influence. And uh, you did mention earlier that some people haven't read Hans. They criticize him. I think part of the reason for that is because he became more popular with the publication of his democracy book, which followed his first two or three more more scholarly, uh, uh, more philosophical works. And he became popular by a lot of people because of that, because of his theories about uh, monarchy and democracy and immigration and things like that. And I don't know if a lot of those people have gone back and read the earlier, more foundational work. Right. Now, even even the democracy book, though, is for a popular style book. It's about as scholarly a popular book as you're ever going to see. But Absolutely. you're right. It, it is on that level. And it's published by a, a press. Uh, I think it was Transaction that more or less catered to the public. But the, yeah, you're right. Those a theory of socialism and capitalism, and the economics and ethics of private property. Beautiful thing about these books today is that they can be read for free. Yep. So I'll actually link to the free versions that you can read online um, over at tomwoods.com/998. The democracy book you're going to have to buy. I'll link I, to that. I, I have a. I have a. I think there is a link to a. Uh a version online, but it's not exactly legit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I want it, if I want to do that, but but uh, then also we were mentioning he has a short, like a it's an essay in booklet form yes. called "Economic Science and the Austrian Method." This yes. thing is beautiful from 1995, absolutely beautiful. So I'll link to that. I'll link to the Feshtrip. There's a lot of material people can read. So let, let's let's get to the, the the key question: Where do they jump in? What's the first one? Is it theory of socialism and yeah. capitalism? Honestly, I would start with the theory of socialism and capitalism. I, I mean, basically, chronological order is good. Read that one, and then read the uh, the, the economics and ethics of private property. Okay, um, and then what I had noticed over the years was there were several of his best articles that had never been put into a book, and most of those are included now in the Great Fiction, which was published by Laissez Faire a few years later. So that's uh, like a counterpart to the economics and ethics of private property. But I would say. Read the theory of socialism and capitalism, and then read that short monograph of his um, on um, praxeology and the e economic science and the Austrian method. I think is the title, yeah. and those are all online and free. And they are just if you're interested at all, like an Ayn Rand sort of theory of concepts and a, her criticism of Kant's idealism, and you're interested in realism. And you're also interested in Rothbard and his Aristotelian sort of spin on Mises and Mises himself, which is a sort of a realistic Kantian take on things. This book is just heaven for you because it's a blend of, of all those approaches. It's not Randian, but it would be of interest to Randians. Let's take a few minutes, if we could, to talk about controversy surrounding Hans. I mean, we might as well say something about it. I mean, even though I really do just want to talk about the basics of his books so that people will know where to start, because really you should read the books and not listen to a podcast episode. You should read the books. They're fantastic. But he's attracted a lot of controversy. He's bec And the thing is, a couple things here. He doesn't really respond to critics. He responded yeah. to critics of argumentation ethics. Yeah. But these days, if some guy calls him a racist or whatever, that is about the last thing in the world he cares about, which makes them crazy because, of course, he's supposed to come begging for forgiveness on his knees and, oh, my goodness, uh, I hope you're not upset at me. He could not possibly care any less. And that, I think, more than anything else drives people crazy because they feel like – Wait a minute, wait a minute. We've set the moral standards for this society, and we're the ones who are going to decide who's forgiven and who's you know who's in good standing and who isn't. And you don't even care. <laughs> what is the matter with you? So where are people getting this uh, this anger toward Hans? I mean, I assume it's not because they disagree with his public goods theory. Well, you know, it's weird to me because I – he's one of the sweetest, gentlest, most sincere, honest, and intelligent Absolutely. I've ever met. Without a doubt. Uh, and he has obviously been a hardworking advocate for liberty in, in Austrian economics for, I don't know, 40 years now. Since how, how many foreign language translations are there of his books? You used to keep track of this. Oh, it's like – it's in the – it's almost approaching 30 now, I think. So it's it's there, there, there have been translations all the time, um, and I have them on his website, HansHoppe.com, which I help him – I help maintain for him. There were a couple of statements he made that were taken out of context. Um, 
you know, it's to the point now where if you say you're against the uh, the uh, anti discrimination law, then everyone says you're a racist. So it's part of it is is that kind of reaction. But I think he had said one time in his uh, he was talking about imagining a private society of the future, and he expects there to be a higher role for private morality, private communities, and even maybe something like covenants where people that have certain – they agree on certain values to, to live together. And he had some comment that um, people that advocate principles that are contrary to the basic unit of society, which is the kind of conservative – Family unit, right, and what and kind of uh, conservative values, you know, hard work, honesty, things like that. People that advocate for things like communism would be, he said, be physically removed. But what he meant was people wouldn't want to live there near, near to them, right? And they would use private means to do that. And he also said something like advocates of homosexuality. And I think what he meant there was someone coming in and just vocally criticizing. Heterosexuality, like saying that everyone should be this way or whatever. So he was talking about advocates, and people took that to mean that he was – he thought homosexuals themselves should be banned, which he's clarified in comments and, and explained many times. He, of course, doesn't believe that at all. In fact, he endorsed Rothbard's kind of uh, comment that you could also imagine – this gorgeous mosaic, I think, is some expression where you have different types of covenant communities or or neighborhoods around the world, which some are more uh, countercultural in their in in their in their practices and their beliefs, and some are more cr- traditional and Christian or whatever. So that was part of it. Also, he gotten he he had there was a flap at UNLV when he was a professor at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he used. Um, homosexuality as an example of a time preference situation where he said that people that don't have children are not as oriented toward the future because having a child makes you think about the future more. So that would give you lower time preference. And he he said he just observed that so a group that tends not to have children as much like homosexuals might have lower time preference in that respect. And some student complained and he got censured and his career was threatened there and he got the ACLU to defend him and he won. So he heroically stood up to these guys. So he's definitely not uh, – I advised him at the time too. I would say just take the deal because you know, I'm a lawyer and I'm always looking at probabilities. But he, he had – he was brave enough to fight it. He wasn't going to go down without a fight, so I admire that about him. Well, I want to say something about this whole covenant community thing because I think there are some libertarians, some anarchist types who – I think their vision for what society would look like is – not very well fleshed out. They just imagine that we really would be atomized individuals just walking around doing our own thing and that every place on earth would be exactly like every other place. Yes. You know, and that's their diverse world where every place looks exactly yes, like every other exactly. place. Exactly. But but some people do want to live among themselves, whether it's a Christian community or whatever it is. Yes. They just want to live among themselves. Leave them alone. Yes, they know that that's the biggest sin in the world is wanting to live with people who are like you. We all get that. We all know we're going to be demonized for saying it, but sometimes that's what you want. Like during the day I go to work and I see crazy people all day and I love them, but when I go home to relax, I just want you know, my neighbors to be quiet, uh, you know, conservative, just, I, I just want quiet. I just want peace. So a covenant community, I was just seeing a Facebook thread where people were, were just, oh, they were saying, oh, this, it's just like more little states. These are just like little states, except they're not because you enter into them voluntarily, but they can't get over the idea that people could voluntarily agree to rules. But in an anarcho-capitalist society, there's no reason to think that I would want to live in a neighborhood where my next-door neighbor could, you know, paint his house hot pink and and uh, you know put all kinds of crazy stuff all over it. Whatever we would come up with uh, rules that we all agree on, and so I think sometimes these these anarchists. It's like they're trying to live down to the caricature of anarchists, where you don't believe in any rules, and and no, the sensible I agree. ones yeah. among us are trying to say we do believe in rules, just no, like yeah, state the, enforced rules. Yeah, they're they're supporting the our critics who say that well, you guys can't tell me what society is going to look like in the future, and you don't believe in any rules. You want chaos, not anarchy. And when some of us try to say, well, here's one possible suggestion about how society might look like. Private institutions would take up a lot of the roles that the state is crowded out now and would do a better job of them. It would be more humane. you know. It would be more responsive to what consumers really want. It would be more diverse. Um, 
then you have these kind of simple-minded newer anarchists who say, well, if you believe in law, you believe in the state. So they're, they're, cons- they're ceding the ground to the status because that's what statists believe. They think without the state, there cannot be law and order. And these anarchists that object to the notion of law because they equate it with the state are, are ceding the ground to our opponents. And moreover, one of the ways you can cope with the public goods problem is precisely by offering some goods on a community basis so that you don't have to somehow figure out, well, how would an individual pay for sewer services or whatever? Well, the sewer service is one of the benefits you get when you join Community A. That solves the problem. Street lights are one of the benefits that you get in this residential area when you belong to this community and, you know, you pay some dues and that covers it. Or either, you know, either that – there are other ways that you could just provide these things for free. There are a lot of ways you could provide public goods. Yeah. But one of them is – I mean like the the analogy that Fred Foldery gave on the show a long time ago was when you go to a hotel, you don't pay separately for the elevator. Right. You don't pay separately for the lobby. It's all included in the in – in, in what you pay for, and we don't say, oh, the hotel is like a little state right. because I pay and I get – well, no, the free market is where you pay and you get goods. So uh, communities might be arranged the same way. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, and l- let me say one other thing too uh, before uh, we run out of time, but um, people sometimes say, well, what's the difference between Hoppe and, say, Rothbard? Now, I would say that Hop, like, what's his main contribution or what's the distinction, right? Because uh, in my mind, Rothbard is the libertarian. He's the guy that really is the founding thinker of our modern libertarian movement. Uh, and Ayn Rand was probably the one that got it started. But you know, with Rothbard's Austrian economics and his radicalism and his anti-statism, he is the founding libertarian thinker. Um, Hoppe, I would say, he studied under Rothbard for ten years, and he was a deep Misesian. And a, so Rothbard and Mises are his two main influences. And there's one thing I, I discovered years ago, which I might have pointed out to you. Um, you know, Hans was in Germany. He was initially a socialist. He was in the German educational system. He was brilliant, and he started to reject socialism on his own. And he discovered the works of Bom Bavirk first, and Bom Bavirk's criticism of Marxism. So that got him thinking, and then he started looking for free market ideas, and he came across Friedman and these guys and initially immediately rejected Milton Friedman and that school because of their logical positivism. So he was starting to conclude on his own that economics is a priori like Mises did. So I believe Hans was on the path to basically being a second independent Mises, and then he discovered Mises and realized, oh, this guy's got it figured out already. I'm a Misesian. I, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if he had never stumbled across Mises. We might have a brand new, independent, uh, you know, Austrian Misesian framework generated by Hans uh, from from the scratch. But so I would say he's heavily Misesian. Rothbard influences politics greatly, right? But I would say that some of the differences are that Hans goes way far, way way deeper into the issue of scarcity. Which David Hume analyzed too. So the acknowledgement of the role of scarcity informs his his libertarian property theory more so, I think, than it did for for Rothbard. Um, he's also a bigger skeptic of democracy in like the American Constitution than say Rothbard and, and Mises would have been. So he's more radical in that sense, or he moved a little bit beyond them in its in his critique of democracy and the, like he views the Constitution as just like a centralizing force that was a step backwards and that democracy was a step backwards in many ways from the the earlier monarchic period, whereas Rothbard kind of buys into this libertarian worship of the founding fathers generation you know, and the American original system as being quasi-libertarian. So those are some of the differences uh, between Rothbard and Hoppe. Let me just say a quick thing about my own personal situation regarding Hans. I met him a long time ago, and I – I was kind of becoming a libertarian, but then I went through a like a paleocon phase in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And so I remember there was a time when I was going to speak at the Mises Institute, and Lou very uh, gently said, well, Tom, I, I would appreciate if you would wear your Mises hat rather than your Buchanan hat while you're here. <laughs> so, and I said, of course, right? I'm not going to cause you problems. But I really was kind of a Buchananite. Right, and, right. I, and I still like Pat Buchanan yeah. and all that. But it's it's funny that when people are trying to criticize me today, the, the best they can do is dig up something from like 1995. Right. Well, yeah, when I wasn't really a libertarian, I wasn't really a libertarian. You know, <laughs> duh, right? But I, I did – I was interested in it, and I – 
I was closer to libertarianism than most people were, but I went through that kind of a phase. And, and the thing that got me out of that phase permanently was Hans Hoppe. It was, was reading, I, I, start, I talked to him in 2001. That was the year Democracy, the God that Failed was about to come out. And I told him about my misgivings, and he said, these will all be answered in my book. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'd like to see that. So then I read Democracy, the God that Failed, and I, I basically decided, okay, I've been on the fence about this for a while. But now I officially, I'm officially in the, uh, was it 2001 that book came out? That sounds right. So, somewhere around 2000 or 2001. I said, okay, I am definitely in the libertarian camp. And then I, you know, started calling myself a libertarian. But even for a few years after that, if you read my articles, you don't even see myself referring to myself as a libertarian. It took me a while. Right. It took me a long while. If I had, if I had just, if, if Hans had written this book earlier, maybe it would have saved me a lot of trouble. And of course, with the internet today, you can go through 10 ideologies in five months, <laughs> you know, but in the old days, you had to read books and it took a long time. <laughs> well, you know, I, and I've heard. I think you've had some interviews with Buchanan on your show, and um, he is he's brilliant. He's so likable, and he's yeah. so smart in some areas. Uh, I understand the appeal there, uh, and, and Hoppe likes him too. I think he's actually criticized Buchanan in that article on um, on Francis. He did criticize Buchanan for his. Uh, uh, I think his like uh, uh, his trade his sort of trade views. You know his his uh, right. economic nationalism type views. But um, but no, I had a similar experience with Hans. I sent him an article one time to review. It was on federalism, and he said something like, yeah, it's all right, but because I was talking about the Constitution and all this, and he said – but you, he goes, you Americans, libertarians focus so much on the U.S. Constitution like it's special, and I, it struck me, and I stopped thinking. I started thinking, yeah, he's, he's got a point actually. <laughs> it's not some proto-libertarian uh, mechanism for controlling or getting a good state. It's really not. It was really a centralizing coup almost. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true, it's true, and and I mean now I've argued, I mean you know the the arguments mm -hmm. on, on both sides of that. I mean we can say well the nationalists tried to ram through what they wanted, but the constitution was still sold as a yeah. decentralizing thing. But the 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 point is there were time bombs in it yes. that over time could be and were in fact exploited by people who were you know who just wanted power and and yeah uh, I I used to I've I've come a little bit in the like the Sheldon Richmond direction over the years. Really? He, okay. He persuaded me that like I used to argue the interstate commerce clause was never meant to grant all this great power to the feds and all this, you know, and I don't want it to. But, so but the argument's a little bit uh, convenient, but you know, he persuaded me that a lot of this language is very uh, amorphous and some of the people that wrote it did have some of these things in mind. Uh, John Hasnas has a really great article, the, the Myth of the Rule of Law, where he talks oh, yeah, about yeah. about how so much of legislative and statutory and constitutional language it does not actually have an objective clear answer. It, it is subject to the whims of the people that have that are left to interpret it. Yeah, and so no matter how good your intentions are – when you're drafting a constitution, let's say, although this isn't his main argument, but you're going to run afoul of this problem that you can't. Well, anyway, I, in fact, I did a whole episode with him on this. This myth of the rule of law was one of these articles that I read. Yes, it's that a I, classic. I told him on the show that I indignantly rejected it when I first read it. Yeah. And that eventually I basically, you know, I found myself shaking my fist at the sky and saying, Hasness. You were right, <laughs> you know. Eventually, and, and those are the best articles of all—the ones that yes. eat away at you until you finally just have to surrender. So I'm well, going to link to that one. You know, another really good one like that is uh, Kuzan's article in the JLS. From he's not a libertarian. It's it called. Um, um, do we ever get out of anarchy? Is it do we one? ever get out of anarchy? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and he wrote a he revisited later, which wasn't as good. And I think he he submitted another article to my paper, the, my journal, the Journal of Libert I mean, the Libertarian Papers Journal. And so, but um, but you know, Hans actually in his democracy book, this is kind of what he talks about. The logic of democracy is that it has to lead to more centralized state power. It doesn't matter what a paper constitution says; they are going to, because of the nature of the state. They're going to use whatever means they can, and that long article you mentioned earlier, banking and nation states, he traces the the kind of actual steps the state takes to seize control. You know, it takes control of education, it takes control of the roads, transportation, it takes control of communication, and finally it takes control of banking and money. So it has its tendrils in all these areas of society, so it can basically buy support and make everyone dependent upon it and control them. It's it's really insidious and and uh, 
the, the thing is this is the nature of the state. Even if you have a paper constitution, even if you have democracy, or maybe even especially if you have democracy. In a way, it's kind of like you should ask yourself, suppose you were – because some people might say, oh, that's an unnecessarily cynical view of the state. All right. Well, suppose you were about to think of a way to dominate people and keep them dependent on you and and, and be able to lord it over them. What sectors of society would you want to control? Yeah. And it'd be exactly the same ones yeah. that the state does. Now, either that's an amazing coincidence or this they're doing this on purpose. Transportation, security, law, communication, education of the kids. I mean <laughs> – Yeah. So do you see why you read Hans Hoppe and your brain explodes and you think, OK, uh, let me put all this goo back in my head because I got to read some more Hans and learn <laughs> learn about how the world works. It's thrilling and exciting stuff, which is why it's such a shame – that well, first of all, that even some of his own supporters haven't really read him. But secondly, that people of frankly bad will are driving people unnecessarily away from maybe the greatest uh, living libertarian theorist we've got, and that that ain't right. And hence, Tom Woods show episode number nine ninety eight. So, uh, what are your final thoughts on this, Stephen? Well, uh, you just reminded me of – I think it's Lou Rockwell's chapter in the Festschrift to Hans that he had some anecdote about how Hans gave a speech, and he was just criticizing the expansion of the state and the U.S. Constitution in front of an audience of people that are somewhat friendly towards the Constitution. He said the audience was so silent you could hear a pin drop. I mean so the power of its ideas, it makes people think. Um, he, it doesn't matter what his unfair critics say because uh, his work is all online. You can read it, and you can see what he says yourself. And when you listen to his speeches um, – uh, and look, I will mention one other thing. I did a six-lecture course on Hans in 2011 called The Social Theory of Hoppe. It's on, it was on Mises Academy, and it's all online on my site. Um, so anyone who wants to go study more about Hans can read his works, uh, which are all online and free, or they can listen to my um, 2011 – video presentation about his theories it's as i say it really is i know it almost sounds fanboyish but to say but his work really is exciting intellectually exciting there's nothing dull it's like reading rothbard nothing dull about reading rothbard nothing dull about reading hans hoppe so a lot of great resources yeah he, he electrified me when i came across him and i still think his first book is my favorite book i've ever read um so and i you know i have my own thing as i've written but i'm not too proud to say that i'm I'm kind of like Hans's fanboy or amanuensis, some people say, <laughs> you know, someone who spreads <laughs> the ideas of someone else. But, uh, you know, because of his ideas. And um, I think they're well worth reading for any libertarian. So I'm going to have a bunch of them linked at tomwoods.com slash 998. So I urge people to check those out. And Stefan, uh, safe travels as you head over to visit with Hans. And, and just let him know that there is a huge community of listeners out here that would pretty much crawl over broken glass if that would somehow help to get Hans onto my show. So just <laughs> casually mention that and uh, safe travels and thanks a lot. Good luck with 1000. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for today. Definitely want to check out tomwoods.com slash 998. And don't forget to join me for the 1000th episode event, which we've postponed to September 30th. 1000th episode of the show. I know it's episode 998, but I'm going to skip over episode 1000, go right to 1001, and then when we do our live event, then I'll reinsert, I'll insert episode 1000 in the missing spot. But anyway, it's going to be great. I've got a couple special guests that uh, you don't know about, but also uh, the ones who are on the bill are Michael Malice, Tom DiLorenzo, and our MC Eric July. Costs you nothing to attend, so definitely make sure and be there. And help me spread the word, tomwoods.com slash Orlando, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.